my name is Ben Keller. I'm a fifth year PhD candidate at Berkeley. Uh, you all know, of course, that uh, RISC-V originated uh, several years ago with the uh, you know, first intent to allow those of us who were uh, grad students at Berkeley to pursue interesting circuits and architecture research. And so even though uh, all of you in this room have now done incredible things with it, uh, we at Berkeley are still pursuing uh, interesting circuits and architecture research with RISC-V. And so this is uh, going to be an update on one of our more recent test chips. Um, so uh, as all of you in the room know, uh, energy efficiency is the key constraint today in, in uh, every layer of computing. Uh, in particular, uh, we're focused here on a mobile class of systems uh, in which uh, workloads tend to be especially bursty and changing very quickly between periods of high and low activity. And so uh, all, all commercial SOCs nowadays use uh, some form of adaptive voltage scaling in which the voltage will be uh, turned up when you need more uh, compute and turned down when you want to save power. Uh, but it turns out that uh, in this research, we're interested in pursuing uh, faster adaptive voltage scaling than is enabled in these commercial systems because we want to be able to save as much energy as possible at these fine time scales and not have waste as is shown in the, in the cartoons here. So uh, commercial systems like you might find in your smartphone uh, can't achieve this sort of fine-grained adaptive voltage scaling that we're interested in demonstrating here. Uh, the main constraint here is that they use off-chip voltage regulation. And so uh, off-chip conversion uh, is uh, easier to implement in many ways, but it has several drawbacks. Uh, because of the large uh, passives that needs to be, need to be charged or discharged, there can be only slow mode transitions between different voltage states. Uh, second, the number of bumps onto your chip is limited, meaning that you can supply only a few different uh, high-quality uh, voltage supplies that are resilient to noise if they're coming from outside. And so you're limited to a few different discrete voltage domains. Finally, the use of off-chip components increases system cost. In contrast, uh, in this research, we pursue on-chip regulation, which allows for fast transitions uh, because we only have uh, two fixed supplies that we can down convert to many more uh, different modes. We can have many uh, voltage domains on the chip. Um, and finally, uh, we eliminate off-chip components, which can save, re uh, reduce system costs. And so I'm going to be talking about our work to implement on-chip regulation, as well as integrated power management that allows us to perform very fast feedback loops for adaptive voltage scaling. So this is a, a block diagram of the SOC that I'll be talking about today. Um, there's a lot of different pieces, as you can see, and so I'm going to step through a few of the key subsystems here. Um, the integrated voltage regulation and the adaptive clocking, which you'll see uh, turns out to be very necessary in the way that we're implementing the system. The application processor, um, as well as a separate power management unit. Um, so I'll be talking about these four subsystems in turn. Uh, starting with the integrated voltage regulators. Uh, we've presented on this work in the past, but a brief recap uh, is that uh, we implement uh, switch capacitor DC-DC converters integrated entirely on DAI. Uh, there's, of course, a lot of circuits research to build these kinds of systems and circuits uh, in the past, uh, but most switch cap regulators uh, uh, perform a form of regulation called interleaving, which is shown uh, in, in the left on the slide. So in these interleave designs, there are many unit cells, and, and the uh, fly capacitance is divided between all of those unit cells. And each one switches in turn in an interleaved fashion. This means that each switching event uh, moves only a small amount of charge. So you can see that the output voltage is relatively flat, as shown by the, the green line. Uh, the problem with this approach is that each time you switch one of these unit cells, you're charge sharing across the rest of the network. And so this, uh, you, can, you can do theoretical analysis to show that this uh, imposes a theoretical upper bound on the convergency of this conversion efficiency, excuse me, of this approach, where conversion efficiency here is defined as, as uh, power delivered over power supplied. So uh, interleaving doesn't provide high enough efficiency for this to work in a realistic system with decent power densities. So instead, in the system, we pr pursue a simultaneous switching approach in which all of the unit cells switch all at once. Uh, this eliminates charge sharing losses, but it leads to this large output voltage ripple, which you can see on the right. And so in order to achieve high efficiencies in a digital system, the clock needs to speed up and slow down as the voltage ripples. And so you can see that in, the, in this cartoon, when the voltage is near the V high, the clock runs a little faster. And when the voltage is near V low, it slows down, such that uh, setup times in your digital logic are not violated, but you get the best possible efficiencies for the design. Uh, so we designed these reconfigurable switch cap converters uh, to operate in four different discrete operating modes. Um, switch cap regulators work best uh, when they're 
uh, targeting a particular conversion ratio according to their topology. Um, so we can reconfigure into these four modes that give us a wide operating range uh, from one volt, which is the nominal for the process, down to about uh, 500 millivolts. The uh, switching is actuated by a simple lower bound comparator, comparator that compares the generated output voltage against a fixed reference. And when it gets too low, uh, the network switches and, and delivers more charge to the, the core supply. So that's how we do our voltage conversion. Uh, these uh, switch cap regulators are integrated entirely on die uh, in, with no off-chip passives. But as you saw in the two slides ago, in order for this to work properly, you need an adaptive clock generator that's going to speed up and slow down to track the voltage ripple. And so that's what I'll talk about next. Uh, this uh, block diagram shows how we generate the adaptive clock. Uh, the system in this design is actually very simple. Uh, it's a free running oscillator. And so we have these uh, delay units, these replica delay pads that are supplied by the same rippling supply voltage that the, that the core sees. And so uh, the replica delay pads are made up of different uh, standard cells. And it's these big trees of muxes. So you can select different combinations of standard cells to best track your critical path in the core. And so this means that once you've tuned these delay units to match the critical paths in your core, then the clock that's generated, uh, the, each clock edge is generated based on uh, that, the way in which your supply voltage is changing. And so the clock adjusts on a cycle by cycle basis to track the rippling supply voltage ensuring that setup times aren't violated, but again, running the core as fast as possible at the most efficient point for any given voltage. So next I'll talk about and getting, getting over to the RISC-V side of the work, I'll talk about the application processor. Um, so this is a you know, variant of the uh, RISC-V rocket core. Uh, this tape out was about two years ago. So you know, take where rocket is now and rewind about two years and you'll have the RTL that we were using. Um, we did, of course, you know, modify it to fit our needs in terms of all of the custom IP that we've added. Um, so I'm sure most of you are familiar with, with Rocket, so I won't go into the de details here. We have a 16 uh, kilobyte I cache and 32K D cache. Uh, this design does not have an L2. It's a single uh, scalar core. Um, because the core is on its own voltage domain, there's asynchronous uh, FIFOs and level converters to talk to the fixed uncore voltage domain. Um, and this does implement a tethered boot via uh, FPGA, as uh, those of you that stopped by my demo booth last night, you were able to see that in action. Um, tightly coupled with the application core is the Berkeley uh, vector unit, or at least the, implica in the uh, implementation of it from two years ago. So this is an earlier version of our, our vector machine. Uh, you can think of it as implementing uh, a custom ISA ex extension that's sort of a predecessor to what Krista uh, presented this morning. Um, so this is tightly coupled to Rocket um, in, you know, with, within the core via this, this Rock interface that many of you have used or experimented with before. And so the uh, scalar core can issue commands to the vector unit um, that allow it to accelerate uh, common data parallel workloads. So this design has uh, two FMA units, so it has a peak throughput of four gigaflops per cycle uh, when, it's, when it's humming along smoothly. So uh, finally, I want to talk about some of the novelty on this chip in particular, which is to do with power management. So first, I want to talk about uh, how we can measure power on this chip. And it turns out that we almost get this for free. It turns out to be very easy for us to measure power. Because of the fact that we're intentionally rippling our supply voltage in this way, um, and moreover, those ripples are uh, moving a, a known amount of charge on a fixed capacitance at a known reference voltage. So every switching event, therefore, corresponds to a fixed amount of energy transferred to the core. And so this means simply that uh, the amount of energy transferred, transferred per unit time is the power consumption of the core at, at uh, near instantaneous uh, measurement. And so when the ripple is slow, that corresponds to low core power consumption. Uh, when the ripple is fast, that corresponds to high core power consumption. And so we can simply instrument the, the clock that's being used to toggle the DC-DC unit cells with a counter and read that counter order to tell how much power the core is sinking at any instant. So in order to do that work, uh, we actually implemented a second smaller core to serve as a power management unit. So this is the very first uh, implementation of, of Zscale in RTL. Um, many of you, again, will be familiar with this, but it's a, a three-stage pipeline that implements RV32IM. Uh, this design has an eight kilobyte scratch pad that's backing uh, you know, loads and stores for both instructions and data. Um, and we simply mapped it to the upper half of the memory space um, so that at boot time, programs can be loaded into the scratch pad uh, 
Um, there's not that much bypassing, et cetera, because we didn't really want to stress critical paths and performance isn't very important to us here. And the, the multiply and divide units are uh, fully unrolled to be you know, as slow as possible to save hardware resources. So I, I think we implement this in something like 10 or 15K gates, um, as well as the, the scratch pad SRAMs, which dominate the area. And this is sitting in our fixed one volt domain in the Uncore. And most importantly, it has access to all of the uh, control registers in our design. So we take the uh, CSR space of Zscale, which is part of the ISA spec, and we map the what we call the system control registers, or SCRs, confusingly, uh, which are not part of the ISA spec, but are responsible for controlling all of the uh, custom IP, as well as reading those counters that I discussed earlier. Uh, and we map those into the PMU CSR space. So by simply doing a CSR read or write, we can uh, read and write uh, the different subsystems on our chip. And so we can implement the kinds of feedback loops that you see uh, sketched in the diagram here, where we take these uh, counters and read them uh, from the power management unit, program whatever uh, algorithm we'd like to actuate changes in, in the voltage setting according to the changes in, in workload or uh, status of the core. Um, so this is being all, all integrated onto a single die, which means that the feedback can be very fast, as you'll see uh, when I present the results in a moment. So here's the entire system. Uh, you can see the core uh, area in gray is supplied by 48 uh, switch capacitor DC-DC unit cells uh, with that rippling supply voltage. Uh, there's some other subsystems, as you can see, that I don't have time to talk about today, but uh, you can look up uh, publications to read more about that. So uh, we taped out this chip in 28 nanometer FTSOI. Uh, the area is just about three millimeters squared with the core taking up a third of that. You can see it in the center of the floor plan shown here with the voltage regulation along either side. Um, the PMU is very small. Uh, total something like half a million standard cells, all told. Um, so I had this demo out on the bench yesterday, but you couldn't see this because uh, it was covered up. So the, the chip itself is wire bonded directly onto the board. We do this to reduce the inductance of these bond wires as much as possible. If it were packaged, the, the wires would have to be much longer. Um, we then, because it's a tethered system, uh, connect this uh, to a uh, Xilinx Z board, which acts as the host uh, for the processor. So that serves as the backing uh, handles memory requests uh, into its own DRAM and emulates uh, system calls and so forth. And uh, we can boot Linux and run all of the RISC-V software uh, stack that you are familiar with. So uh, now to briefly talk about some of the results that we measured off of this chip. So here you can see a, a waveform that hopefully clarifies exactly what I mean when I'm talking about this rippling supply. So in blue, you have the core voltage. Uh, you can see it's rippling quite a bit over something like 100 millivolt range. Uh, and the adaptive clock is automatically speeding up and slowing down over the duration of that ripple. Uh, note, even during the transition, we don't need to stop the clock or pause the core or anything like that. It can just uh, continue to operate as normal, continue running whatever workload we'd like. And the transitions are very fast uh, on the order of tens of nanoseconds between these different voltage modes. And so with the adaptive clock, we're able to achieve uh, very high system conversion efficiencies in the range of 82 to 89% uh, for the system. Um, which is uh, you know, pretty decent compared, you know, in, it's in the same ballpark as off-chip regulation while getting all these additional benefits. Um, this uh, schmoo plot shows uh, the operation of the chip over uh, sweeping voltage and frequency. In each box is the efficiency in double precision gigaflops per watt uh, running a matrix multiply kernel on the vector unit. Um, so uh, per Krista's questioner earlier, yes, uh, vectors are, are performance and are efficient, um, as we're showing here. So we're getting uh, 54 double precision gigaflops per watt peak uh, in this design. This is in uh, bypass mode, so we're supplying a voltage directly to the core here. Um, if we are using the regulators in the, the one volt, one half mode, then of course you pay the uh, conversion penalty, and so it looks like something more like 42 double precision gigaflops per watt in that circumstance. Uh, one aspect that I'll touch on very briefly is that our, the fact that we're using this FDSOI process allows us to do uh, a much wider range of tuning of the body bias voltage than you can do in, in normal bulk silicon. Um, and so you can see here, um, we're sweeping body bias, which allows you to basically tweak the threshold voltage of the transistors in the core according to you know, your particular workload. Uh, 
So we're sweeping body bias voltage while keeping supply voltage constant. And the uh, best energy efficient operating point uh, changes depending on your, whether your benchmark is more compute intensive um, and sinking more power in the core, or whether it's simply doing integer operations and not sinking as much power. Um, so this is another tuning knob that we have to play with the efficiency of our design. Uh, lastly, I want to talk about power measurement and some of the ways that we're able to use that result. Um, so in this uh, waveform, you can again see the, the blue core voltage rippling, but here the green is the toggle clock, um, which again, uh, we're counting to measure core power. And you can see the results of that in the plot on the right. Uh, the uh, measured core power tracks really well with the DC-DC switching frequency. So when the converters switch more quickly, it means the core is sinking more power. Um, this is calibrated, you know, verified against bench measurements. And so we can therefore use this um, to implement some of these uh, power management algorithms. And so in particular, I'll show results from our adaptive voltage scaling uh, work. So we're measuring SCDC-DC toggle frequency, as I just described. And then the uh, PMU is using that information to estimate the power and therefore make a guess about the program phase of the program running on the application core. And what it's going to do is it's going to adjust the core voltage in response. And so in particular, if the power is high, then it assumes that the uh, application core is in a compute intensive uh, phase of its operation. So we should speed up the core to finish that compute as quickly as possible. Uh, in contrast, if the power is low, uh, then it's in a memory bound program phase. And so therefore, you want to slow down the core because it doesn't impact performance very much and you save energy. So this is the algorithm we ran. Um, and we, we ran a, uh, a, a hand-coded benchmark on the application core that's basically just switching between these two program phases at, at a time scale of about uh, 15 microseconds. And so uh, without fine grain adaptive voltage scaling, uh, you simply wouldn't be able to track those kinds of workloads, workload changes, and so you'd have to operate at the higher voltage in order to get the same performance. On the other hand, <clears throat> excuse me, if the power management unit is able to detect those changes, it can switch during the idle phase to the lower voltage while not losing any performance, so stepping back up to the higher voltage during the active phase. And you can see uh, this is just a close-up of the transitions here. And so you can actually see in these waveforms the change in the frequency of the DC-DC toggle clock. You can see it speeding up which corresponds to a change in the program phase. And the PMU detects this and uh, actuates a change in the voltage within less than a microsecond. So you can see it going up uh, and, and going down as the program phase changes. And so this is a really cool result because it allows us to buy an awful lot of energy savings that we get from scaling the voltage down when we don't need that compute with negligible performance loss because uh, when the processor actually has work to do, we speed the voltage right back up to complete that work. Um, so obviously, this is a synthetic workload. So this is mostly showing uh, sort of an upper bound on how well you can do in this circumstance. But nonetheless, it's a, it's a really cool result, uh, putting all the pieces of this system together. Uh, so to briefly summarize um, the highlights of the system, uh, we implemented this 28 nanometer uh, energy efficient part. It features efficient integrated voltage regulation, combined with it a performant application processor and integrated power management. Uh, and put all together, we can do this, this sub-microsecond adaptive voltage scaling to save a lot of energy with mi minimal performance impact on, on these uh, workloads that have fine grain program phase changes. Um, so that kind of concludes this part of the talk. And I'm going to transition a little for the last few slides uh, to talk about another perspective on what we're working on at Berkeley. Um, because uh, as we've been building chips over the years, uh, we've kind of realized that in addition to talking about what we build. We also, also think it's uh, important to talk about how we're building it uh, and, and the importance of thinking about tool flows and methodology in this work. Um, and so I'm going to talk about uh, some of the thinking we've been doing in defining this, this idea of agile hardware development, what that means for us, and how we use it to develop chips. Um, so uh, I'm certain most of you in the software world are familiar with kind of the story of the agile manifesto and the revolution in the, in the uh, late 90s, early 2000s, where people were switching over to these ideas. Um, but the story, uh, as, as Dave Patterson tells it, goes that you know, back in the battle days, uh, software was developed via this uh, waterfall model uh, in which you had you know, large individual teams that would spend months on these different parts of a project and then throw it over the wall to the next team. Um, you would specify the entire project at the beginning and then set yourself deadlines that you might or may not make. And so, of course, these projects were not always very successful. 
And so in contrast, there was a, a move towards this agile development style where small groups of teams are uh, making incremental improvements to a design and seeing it all the way through the cycle with continual feedback about what's working and what's not so that the specification can be changed to adapt to the needs of the project and the user. Um, and so this was a, a big success in the, in the software world. Um, and we think that a lot of these ideas sh can and should translate into, into hardware design as well. Um, so we came up with, uh, with, with uh, you know, shamelessly ripping off the uh, original Agile manifesto. We came up with an Agile hardware manifesto um, that has these four main ideas. So we favor incomplete fabricatable prototypes over fully featured models. Um, that is, we'd prefer to build something in silicon, even if it doesn't have every feature we'd like, rather than spending um, a year making a really detailed architecture simulator. We think it's important to tape out chips. We think that it proves that our ideas actually work and make sense. And you really uh, hash out all the bugs in a way that you cannot if you're just um, in simulation land. Um, favoring collaborative, flexible teams over rigid silos. Uh, so um, at Berkeley, you know, by the necessity of the fact that you know, we're grad students, we're necessarily in a small team. Uh, and so we need to all work together and all be familiar with everyone's work in order to make these, these big projects happen. Uh, Improving tools and generators over improving the instance. So uh, as um, uh, through, through our work with Chisel and through other tools, um, we've really focused on trying to build, build things for longevity and build things for the future, rather than trying to just hack together a, a single use design. Um, and finally, responding to change over following a plan. That, that one's copied directly from the original uh, Agile manifesto, but we still think it's really important. Um, so I, I'm not going to talk about the Chisel HTL uh, in detail because it's been referenced many times at this in previous workshops. But uh, we really do think it is a really important way to think about hardware design, regardless of whether you're using this particular language or not. Um, it, it's you know Ver, Verilog 95 or Verilog 2001 is is simply untenable to build these big kinds of projects, and so need to think about you know how we can move to higher levels of abstraction and how we can make things extensible and configurable uh, so that we can uh, do this kinds of experiments and build extensible designs. Um, and of course, the, the rocket ship generator, which you heard from Yunsup about yesterday, has also been a really uh, key enabler of building lots of chips. Um, and lastly, I'll touch on this idea of a tape-in, which uh, we aspire to uh, pursue at, at Berkeley as much as possible. Um, so rather than simply having a fixed deadline of a tape out and kind of setting all of our deadlines in, in anticipation of that, the idea behind a tape in is, is a more agile approach. And so in which we uh, first assemble the smallest kernel of workingness that we can and run it all the way through the uh, ASIC design flow as well as the verification flow. And so at the end of that process, we've hopefully ironed out most of the tools, uh, the bugs in the tools, and we have a design that is feature and complete, but uh, functional, and is you know, LVS clean and DRC clean or mostly clean, such that we have something that's ready to tape out if we need it. And then we can go back and iterate and improve QOR and add features and make more improvements over time. But really uh, sprinting to that first, uh, what we call a tape in, so a completed design that may or may not get taped out eventually, is really important uh, and has, is really uh, an important way to think about this, this chip design process, um, rather than just being hamstrung by this idea of a tape out. Um, and also important is the idea that, you know, a single tape out isn't the end all. Uh, so in, in this Raven project, as you'll see on the next slide, it's very much been iterative, where each, each system has been a prototype for the next system, where we've then added more features and refined things. Um, so, so doing multiple tape outs and rapid iteration allow us to really test and improve the des designs in a way that simply taking three years and trying to build one big chip all at once without, that would have a very low likelihood of success in our experience. Um, so this, this is, the, I think the results kind of speak for themselves here in terms of the, the process. Um, you know, the Raven project, uh, which uh, this chip is the final iteration of the Raven project that I presented on today, so Raven 4. And uh, Yunsov can correct me, but I believe Raven 1 was the very first RISC-V silicon um, to ever ever see the light of day. Um, it wasn't terribly functional, but we learned a lot from it. Um, and so you can see over the years, we've you know built a lot of these using this iterative process. 
Um, and we've, we try to come back to the RISC-V workshops every so often to give an update on, on what we're doing and how we're using the RISC-V tools to advance this kind of research. And so we look forward to continuing these presentations in the future. Um, but for now, I want to conclude by acknowledging our, our funders and uh, ST Microelectronics for donating fabrication for the project. And I'd be happy to take any questions. Thanks. Um, it, it, it seems like the the reason you have these really big um, uh, sawtooth voltage is because you can't get a big enough capacitor on chip. Is that correct? Um, no, that's that's not quite correct. We 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 allow the voltage to ripple intentionally um, because doing so allows you to achieve higher theoretical conversion efficiencies because of the char charge sharing effects that I that I described previously. Yeah, um, but if you, I mean, if you could just like solder a capacitor, a discrete capacitor onto the face of the chip. Yes, you could do that, but that would hurt your conversion efficiency. It would make it would make it so that uh, charge is shared onto the capacitor, and you lose energy when you when you down convert. So we intentionally don't do this. We try to eliminate as much capacitance as possible. Oh, I see. Yeah. And does this scheme work on bulk CMOS? Um, the voltage regulation would have, would work on bulk CMOS. Um, the the main driver of how well it's going to do is the quality of your integrated capacitors. And so we're actually implementing only uh, MOS and MOM capacitors on, our, on this tape out up to metal three. But if you had access to MIMCAP or deep trench in your process, you could get a lot better uh, power density. Hey, Ben. Over here. Hello. Um, so on your timeline slide, I saw one chip that had craft next to it. Is that a different design methodology? Is that, what what is that guy? Um, so, I don't want to talk too much about it because it's still in fab. Uh, so A, it's pre-publication, and B, it might not work. But uh, this this was a 16 nanometer tape out done over the summer, um, and it uh, it does have risk, a risk five core on it as well as a few other bells and whistles. Um, I think the most notable part of that is that we went. Um, and I, sh I shouldn't say we. I was only peripherally involved in this, but uh, the project went went from. Uh, receiving a drop of the PDK to tape out in something like three weeks. Um, so there's kind of proof in the pudding of, of you know, this fast turnaround on a tape in an action. OK, is that, is that that program? That, I'll, I'll talk to you later. Sure, yeah, it's, it's part of the DARPA craft grant. Okay. Um, and it's, it's an ongoing project to further develop this agile stuff. Um, are you familiar with Fiverr? Uh, which was in production for yes. several years, and how does your work compare to Fiverr? I think specifically the two main criteria in the Fiverr paper was power density yes. and the efficiency. So yeah, excellent, excellent question. Um, so, so when uh, Intel first published Haswell in uh, ISSC 2014, you know, at first we were kind of like, oh no, they scooped our research. Um, but it turns out that there's some some issues with the way that they did this. Um, the uh, so for those that aren't familiar, this is the integrated voltage regulation uh, in Intel's Haswell and Broadwell lines. It was actually not implemented in the most recent version. Um, and so- But that, that doesn't mean that there's a problem with fiber. Yeah, well, so I- I mean, Fiber um, actually works. <laughs> that's correct, yeah. But if I can finish, I can yeah. sort of tell you the main design flaws. The, so fiber has uh, on-package inductors, uh, or in the case of Broadwell, uh, inductors built into the PCB. Um, so it's not a fully integrated solution. Um, they do achieve you know, much higher power densities than, than we do in this work, and they have somewhat higher conversion efficiencies, uh, except at very low, uh, at low, very low power. Um, the main problem with fiber is, is actually the fact that the co-design of the inductors was both very expensive, so you know, it's a tremendous amount of engineering effort to make that work properly, um, but as well as the fact that you're just, you're, they were actually adding too much in the third dimension to the package and the board. And so what I've heard is that the reason that they dropped Fiverr in the most recent version is that if you're trying to fit this thing into a, into a tablet, it was just too fat um, to, for, it, for it to fit uh, vertically. Um, the, the other flaw with uh, the, Intel present, the Intel work is that while they did make the uh, changes in voltage modes pretty fast, so on the order of, I think, 300 nanoseconds, not quite as fast as us, um, but their, their clocking still uses these really slow, clunky PLLs, and so they, couldn't, they can't actually relock the PLLs as fast as they can change the voltage. Um, so, there's, so, so for a lot of reasons, um, Intel uh, 
made some progress here, but we still think that they could, you know, and everyone can kind of push further in this direction of fine-grained ABS. Okay, uh, another question. So, uh, given that you have, um, essentially, you have a lot of bouncing on the supply voltage and also on the clock. Essentially, it's like a noise. So, if you want to productize something like that, how would this um, change your guard bands, margins that you have to add? Because one thing I'm curious about is that maybe a lot of benefits will just disappear once you add the guard bands to essentially to to make your system reliable in practice yeah um that's a good question I, and and by the way the uh, i believe itanium did something like this adaptive clock more than 10 years ago or so and they didn't productize it for some of these reasons like yeah. the people just who were in production and volume production they just didn't like it uh, yeah, I think it. Uh, if you need to guarantee that 10 million of these are going to work for for 10 years, uh, this would make you very nervous. Um, I think, uh, in in theory, the adaptive clock actually allows you to eliminate a lot of the guard band uh, that you would otherwise need because we're sort of automatically resilient to voltage droop, you know, and aging and temperature effects. Um, we kind of compensate for those uh, because the replica circuits will generally feel the same pressure that the core does in, in terms of all these effects. Um, but I don't have a concrete answer for you in terms of how much margin would be required. Uh, I think you'd need a lot more experimentation, and ultimately you'd need some 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 sort of integrated adaptive tuning that's going to be smart about about margining in order to make it work. So you really don't have PLL lock times. I mean, because it's you can your PLL works at all the frequencies. I didn't quite get it. Sure. Yeah. So the. Uh, uh, the oscillator is free running, so unlike a PLL, which you know needs okay. to lock to a, a fixed reference, and then you know every time you change the multiplier ratio or something, you need to relock. Uh, in our case, uh, it's simply as you know an edge traveling through a delay, and then after after it propagates, the next edge comes out. Um, so the the advantage to this is that there's no locking or anything, and you don't need to distribute a fixed frequency uh, to you know if you had multiple of these on a die. The disadvantage is you don't know exactly what frequency you're going to get out. Um, but it turns out that this isn't too big of a deal because you can have uh, a, lar a slower control loop in which you can uh, dither you know, between different voltage modes to achieve whatever average frequency you'd like in longer term. So then how do we do timing, timing specs for the unit or for, like between, for circuits? In terms of uh, how do you meet timing closure during design, or how do you advertise a product as running at a particular frequency? Yeah, d during design or during, say, I mean, how do we know it, whether it's really working or not? I mean, so um, for all of the experiments that I showed here, uh, we know I, we know it's working just empirically. Uh, so if the program returns the correct result, then we assume that it's working, and if the program hangs or returns an incorrect result, then we assume it's not. Um, to be clear, the, the, the delay chains in the clock generator um, need to be tuned to, you know, even for, for each die, they need to be tuned to get the best efficiency. So in, uh, to calibrate it, we basically, you know, run, run it faster and faster until it stops working and then pick the last one. Um, during design, uh, I don't think there's, there's a magic, magic solution. We use the same corners that you do to tape out, um, and it turns out that CMOS is still pretty good at, at scaling over that curve. Um, so it seems to work pretty well. Thank you. Okay, one last question. What is the area cost for the capacitors? Um, yeah, good question. So the, the area overhead of the converters is something like 20% of the core that it's supplying in this case. Um, but obviously, this is a research chip. We're not talking about the kind of power densities that you'd see in a server class, you know, 100-watt uh, IBM thing or, and so forth. So this is most appropriate for, like, a mobile 1-watt class processor or maybe IoT. Thank you. As long as it's not a multi-part question. Sorry, one more, <laughs> Sorry, one more question. Oh. <laughs> um, what's the maximum frequency you expect using that adaptive clock? Um, so again, this depends uh, pretty heavily on the corner that, that you know, the, the particulars of the die that you're testing. But on the Shmoo plot, I show operation up to 700 megahertz. Um, there's, there's really no difference. Uh, in terms of functionality, you can push it up to 700 megahertz by supplying an external clock or using the adaptive clock. There's no, there's no penalty for using the adaptive clock in terms of what frequencies you can achieve. And minimum voltage? The minimum operating voltage of the chip is about 450 millivolts. Is that same as SRAM? Um, 
so we're yeah the S the SRAMs are on the same uh, voltage rail. We're actually using custom uh, AT SRAM cells that were designed by Brian Zimmer, who's going to be speaking next. Maybe eventually Brian will speak next. <laughs> <laughs> One more question. <laughs> Are we done? All right, thanks, Ben.